for uh, her presentation. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, we will have a question and answer series. So to begin with, I'm gonna go ahead and officially open up our presentation and start by saying uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Felica Ahastin Bryant. I'm the director of the Native American Educational and Culture Center at Purdue University. And we're pleased to welcome our, our guest, Dr. Grace Bulltail, who will be joining us to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. We have a whole month long of activity schedule and we're really pleased to, um, to host um, Dr. Bulltail and she's coming from us from University of Wisconsin. Um, we will, like I said, be recording this video and we'll be placing it on our on our YouTube page so that way you'll have a chance to review it and we do have some other people that may be joining us and um, and we'll, they'll have a chance to, to view this as well. And um, as we begin our presentation, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, Deb will has automatically muted everybody. And if you are interested, once we get the, the conversation started, you can put a question into the chat and we can answer, or we will just open it up and have you ask some questions once we begin, once at, at the conclusion of um, Dr. Bulltail's presentation. With, um, with the university, we always want to, whenever we are conducting our presentations, I just really want to start off, given that we're talking about tribal resources and land stewardship, I think it's appropriate for us to offer our land acknowledgement at Purdue University. Um, we at uh, Purdue NACC acknowledge the traditional homelands of the indigenous people which Purdue University is built upon. And we honor and appreciate the Potawatomi, the Lenape, the Miami, the Shawnee, and um, there's some additional tribes that are here, but these were the original caretakers of uh, in the original indigenous caretakers. And, you know, through our history, we have, we had a large native presence throughout the country. And um, it is only through forced removal that many of these tribes are no longer with us. So in that respect, um, we have a lot more that are that are not listed, but as a result, you know, we, we want to make sure that we understand the care that they took into preserving the land, but also their footprints are no longer here, but we want people to understand that they play an important role in our survival. So thank you again. And with that, I would like to officially welcome Dr. Bulltail. Grace Bulltail is um, from the Crow and uh, Mandan Hidadza and Arikara Nation in, from Fort Berthold, North Carolina. And she has uh, been an instrumental role in working with the ACES organization. So we'll talk a little about her, her experience there. But she has, um, she received her, her degree from, um, well, I, actually I should mention that you, you also, Grace was, uh, is one of our Sloan scholars as well. And um, she was part of the, the Sloan Indigenous Graduate Partnership Program. And I believe you were uh, with Montana, is that correct, Grace? Montana Tech. Montana Tech, okay. I'm sorry, I'm really bumbling your, your introduction. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do the official, um, the official introduction. Uh, Grace received her Bachelor's of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Stanford University. She completed her master's degree at Montana Tech and um, also you attended um, her master's degree at Montana Tech and Columbia University. She completed her doctoral program in the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, her dissertation research focused on water quality impacts from natural resource development in tribal communities. And she has worked as an engineer developing water resources infrastructure projects prior to starting her doctoral program. Grace has also served as an engineer, engineering instructor at the United Tribal Technical College and continues to work as a consulting engineer. Currently, she is uh, working with the, um, at U University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison and with the, Insti the Nelson Institute as an assistant professor in Native American environment and health and communities. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Grace so she can begin her presentation. Thank you again, Grace, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to, to be asked to um, speak with you all tonight. Um, I really wish that we could be together in person um, and I know competing with um, 
a lot of important TV right now. I was watching CNN all day myself. Um, so, yeah, I um, I uh, want to give some some background um, on myself. I think that I rarely get an opportunity to um, do so in a lot of my lectures. Um, so again, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I've been here um, over a year now. I started last August, and um, I'm part of the Cluster Higher Native American Environment Health and Community, so I'm part of the, um, the environmental component. And I'm also, um, I'm also appointed jointly in the Department of Biological Systems and Engineering. Um, so some background um, of me. I'm originally from Montana, um, big sky country. So this is a, a picture um, of what you will see heading um, into Montana from Wyoming on the I-90. Um, and um, I, I grew up in Montana until I um, attended high school. And I was, I was raised by my grandparents. Um, this is uh, my grandmother here and my oldest sister and um, my adopted mother who, um, who um, really took me in when I, um, I started boarding school um, in the ninth grade in New Hampshire. So I was part of the, um, there was a, a program um, specifically for students from Montana um, to attend the boarding school I went to, St. Paul School in New Hampshire. And um, I was also part of the A Better Chance program. And um, yeah, so, so I, I really had to um, dedicate you know, my, my career um, from, college, from high school onward, um, just wanting to go to college. Um, I'm the first in my family to receive a bachelor's degree for some immediate family. Um, I have nine siblings. So my, my grandparents raised my three sisters and three brothers. So there's kind of an age range there, but um, yeah, that's, that was, um, you know, really, um, really where um, I think that I, <laughs> I, I knew that I wanted to do something with my education. Um, and definitely formidable in, in, um, in directing the scholarship I've been, I'm involved with now. So, um, as mentioned, um, I had attended Stanford uh, for my undergraduate, and um, I went on to attend Montana Tech, um, and then I went on to Columbia University as a um, GEM Foundation scholar. So, um, you know, I I knew that I needed to <laughs> I needed to be able to fund my graduate education. So. Um, luckily, the uh, the Sloan the Sloan program was at was at Montana Tech, um, and I learned about it after I had enrolled in in courses. Um, so that that was really key. Um, like I I knew that I I needed to have funding and to be able to attend graduate school and. Um, I was awarded the GEM Fellowship, and um, that's how I ended up in my master's program. And um, I was there for several years, and I eventually transferred to Cornell to finish my, my doctoral program. Um, and I think really that was, that was um, the best choice for me. Um, Cornell had 
a strong Sloan scholarship program. That's the, um, the, the main, the other mainstream um, minority PhD program that I was in at Cornell. Um, and I, I really wouldn't have been able to finish my, my doctoral program um, with, without that funding, um, and the support there. Um, interestingly, um, there, there weren't very many um, Native Americans in that program, um, which, which is too bad um, because, you know, there's just so many resources there. And I was the first Native American um, woman or um, just period um, to receive a doctoral degree in engineering from Cornell. Um, so, I mean, again, the, these schools have a long way to go, um, which is why you know, we're so thankful for programs like the, um, the SIGP um, to support students, to support um, our graduate students throughout their careers. So the, um, the, re the research that I, I complete um, is really is really centered on um, resource natural resource management, and that that has been central in in what I've studied throughout my graduate education. Um, the the problems that I see with native communities, um, and particularly communities that rely on natural resource extraction. So our our native communities are very rich in natural resources, um, you know, with oil and gas, coal, um, different types of, of mined minerals, uh, you know, uranium, um, and also really, really rich in uh, water resources, timber, and the land itself. So I, I look at, um, you know, what, what are ways that tribes can, can kind of, um, I guess, uh, change the narrative of relying on their resources for development and really regaining um, the, the use of their resources and their land and, um, you know, ultimately, ultimately developing those developing the capacity to um, you know, to support themselves um, and also to to address equity so i'll I'll talk briefly about um, about why these issues are so central um, to resource management I like to include um, a graphic of the of the lands as they were in eighteen fifty one when um, the major treaties were made um, in the in the West. So you see here it's Crow territory where I'm from, um, and really the territory was outlined by the series of rivers and mountain ranges. So this is the Powder River Basin, um, which serves as one of the, um, the boundaries, and that is important because. Um, the Powder River Basin today is very rich in, in mineral resources, particularly coal. Um, so it's uh, cleaner, cleaner burning coal um, since the 70s. It's been the preferred, preferred coal um, to be burned in power plants. And the Powder River Basin is um, Run, runs right through um, Crow territory here. And um, I also wanted to point out my other tribe is the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota. And um, they're located in this region here, which is the Bakken, and also do have a substantial amount of lower grade um, lignite. And again, this is another um, Graphic I like to show that outlines the, the tribal territories. Um, so here's the Crow Reservation, Northern Cheyenne, 
right next to us. Um, both tribes have a significant um, coal resources and the Crow tribe currently um, operates or um, leases their, their um, mineral rights to a, um, a coal, coal mine producer. And they receive royalties from that and that represents a significant amount of their operating budget um, the other, the other coal producing tribe is um, the Navajo and um, up until recently the Hopi down here and again the, sort of where the power plants are located. Um, so a lot of, um, a lot of our resources um, go out to, uh, coal resources go out to fire these power plants located mainly in the Midwest. Um, I also want to, in some of, some of my scholarship, um, I look at the, um, I guess, the fate of the coal, the tribal coal industry. Um, so recently the tribe, the Crow tribe had entered into a significant lease um, of 1.4 billion tons with Cloud Peak Energy um, in 2013. And, um, the Cloud Peak Energy went bankrupt and they um, sold those those assets to Navajo Transitional Energy Company, um, which now operates um, several mines in Montana and Wyoming. And with that, they also gained the um, the mining rights, um, which the which the Crow tribe um, had had leased to to that um, energy company. So that's, that's something that I'm following. Um, but uh, you know, this, this shows the, um, the political interest um, within, within Montana um, and, and these states are, um, are very interested in, in the tribes um, asserting, their, asserting their sovereignty by developing their resources, um, particularly with this current administration. So that's, um, I mean, that's a continuing struggle um, that um, unfortunately that leaves um, the tribes and the tribe, the tribal administration and the tribal members itself um, in a contentious relationship. Um, so I, I um, want to highlight the you know the vast resources in contrast with the. Um, with the the lack of resources that are available to tribal members, um, so in particular water resources, um, you know we have large land bases, um, and and waterways. However, we often are very water insecure. Um, tribal tribal communities can have up to you know, 40% of homes without, um, without an adequate drinking water source. Um, the, um, the home that I grew up in, um, we had to haul, we had to haul our drinking water. We had running water, um, but it was from a well and of lower quality, really high minerals um, and a lot of groundwater um, and really, really a lot of, um, a lot of groundwater. Um, sources. So we, we had to haul these five gallon jugs um, you know, for drinking water. Um, and actually we still do, we still do today because um, in Wisconsin we don't have very good, very good um, water quality. So we're still doing that, but um, you know, we can drive to Walmart and get those. It's about five miles down the road. Whereas um, in, in my home where my grandparents live, it's a really rural area and probably have to have to make a trip about 20 miles round trip um, to fill up those water jugs. And um, in this, this, um, this water insecurity um, is also really exacerbating the, um, the number of tribal communities that are impacted um, by the coronavirus. Um, so this picture is from a tribal community in Washington that um, is very highly impacted by the coronavirus, and um, now they're they're um, really precarious um, water system. Um, 
leads them to, to have to depend on um, the tribe to, to supply drinking water. Um, and you know, so, many community, so many communities just have really vulnerable infrastructure um, that are, that are um, very underfunded. And um, you know the high distances to to travel to um, to have a to have a drinking water source um, it's really disproportionate in um, in rural communities and particular tribal communities and um, so that's that's really been central to um, to the work that I have done um, both as a professional engineer and um, really really where I think that um, that tribal communities um, need need the most help and the most resources and it, it, it is doable um, but um, you know, there's just so many disparities and unfortunately um, you know, with the coronavirus it's it's really impacting the tribal communities um, you know, both both where I'm from and um, it's continuously exacerbated by, by the lack of water resources. So I will touch briefly on the work that um, I've done in water quality um, specifically. In my, my postdoctoral research, um, I, I had been looking at produced water management. So um, produced water um, comes from the wastewater from oil and gas wells. And I was interested in looking at um, um, on what happens to that produced water, um, particularly on tribal lands, and comparing that to federal lands, as well as um, you know, non-tribal non lands throughout the state. Um, and I became interested in that because um, I had observed a lot of wastewater pits um, with um, with coal bed methane in my work on on coal mines, and um, I found very much the same thing was happening with um, oil and oil and gas wells um, in Montana. And what what I found is that the um, the permits for for these these um, discharges from oil and gas facilities, they were they were allowed by the EPA. Um, the EPA permits um, on tribal lands and um, offshore, so in um, offshore oil and gas, so out in the ocean. Um, and really, I, I had a hard time finding um, up-to-date permits for these, like if there were effluent limits. Um, and um, it, it, was really, um, it was really surprising that um, the majority of, the, of these um, outfalls were unpermitted um, on tribal lands and federal lands. Um, you know, however, the... Um, the federal lands were also subject to state effluent limits, whereas the, um, the EPA um, really did not set very many parameters for tribal lands. Um, but I mean, it's really irrelevant because um, a lot of the sites were unpermitted. Um, and um, you know, that's, that's really problematic because um, these these um, these oil fields um, are typically older. So what happens when the oil fields are older is that they produce a large amount of water um, as they age compared to the amount of oil that is harvested. And if um, if these operations had to properly treat the um, the effluent, it would be uneconom uneconomical. Um, so, uh, really, the the state and the federal government, um, I guess, just turned a blind eye to this, um, and that's that's problematic because their their um, 
really placing the burden of regulation onto tribes um, who really don't have the best um, the best capacity to to monitor um, all these environmental problems um, within their borders and um, you know, having to regulate um, something that would be classified as hazardous waste, um, you know, that's, that's just really, really um, inappropriate. And um, it's, it's a huge environmental justice program or environmental justice um, issue for, um, for these tribal programs. And another thing that I found in doing this research is that um, there was also a lot of air quality issues. So um, we looked at the methane that is um, also, also being um, uh, emitted at these sites. And we found that um, pretty much every site I looked at um, on tribal lands had some evidence of um, fugitive methane emissions. And that's a problem because methane is um, a really powerful greenhouse gas, um, you know, several times more, um, more damaging than carbon dioxide. And um, really, uh, there, there isn't too much data on tribal lands. Um, however, the few, the few um, reports in scholarship that I found on this problem show that um, and the worst the worst emitters are found on um, tribal and federal leases and um, i'm I'm hoping to to wrap this up and also combine it with other other research that has been done on tribal lands um, so i I um, talk about land use um, because uh, it, it's such a problem um, on large land-based tribes um, because of the, the complex land tenure situation. Um, so one of, one of the um, questions that I'm interested in is um, how, how can we think about regulating um, the, all of the water resources on tribal land um, when, when there's such a, a disconnect in, in the authority for tribal members to be able to use their land and um, the way that, the way that um, those water resources are allocated um, and how that's, that's such a problem that really, really hasn't been documented um, very well. So, <laughs> I, um, I will try to, to um, briefly um, uh, explain this, this problem. So this is, um, the, this is uh, Crow tribal land ownership. And um, typically on most reservations, there are um, three main types of land, land owners. So the tribe itself, um, individual tribal members as allottees, and um, fee landowners, which are primarily um, non-tribal members. So um, this is an issue for a lot of a lot of tribes, um, and particularly um, the Crow tribe. So I I have been um, I have been uh, working on an analysis that um, where I look at. Um, each watershed. So um, I break down the, um, the amount of trust land so that's owned by the tribe and by um, individual tribal members. And um, that's, so that's, um, that's uh, the tribe itself has control over that, which is why it's called trust land. Um, and I, I look through and um, I, I show the, you know, the, the breakdown of where, you know, where the most um, land is owned and by the tribe itself, and that's mainly in, in the mountainous areas. Um, but really, um, I'm interested in looking at 
the um, along the the water along the rivers, and my um, my analysis was to oh sorry sorry I don't know what happened there um, so my analysis was to um, to try to think about um, how how much um, how much control do tribal members actually have over their water resources? So this is um, this is tribal members uh, only as allottees. Um, so you can see that it's it's varies throughout the reservation, um, and I'm I'm quantifying this because I I want to to gain a sense of how how does this land tenure um, problem, like what, what impact does that have on, um, so myself as a tribal member, um, anyone that wants to actually use water um, to, to manage their resources, um, what, how does that look and um, what, what are the implications for the entire watershed? Um, and um, sadly, as I'll explain here, um, a lot of a lot of the, the water resources are being used by um, non-tribal members, and um, a lot of the a lot of the benefits of um, you know, hard-fought water settlements um, are not actually going going to benefit tribes um, and, and tribal members. Um, and that's, that's a problem because um, water resources are so highly contested. Um, there, there have been several dams built on our, on our lands um, that just have lasting impacts on, on our, our rights to our water resources. Um, you know, both of my tribes um, have, have these Pixlone dams that are now operated by the government and um, you know this infrastructure um, is is benefiting someone. Um, there's millions of megawatt <laughs> megawatts of power being generated, um, but it's not for the tribes. And you know, in fact, um, it's to our detriment a lot of times. Um, since since we no longer have have rights to this water. Um, and actually um, flooded several of our communities. So um, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, several several tribal governments are going through water settlements. Um, ongoing today, uh, Montana has several set, settled several um, water rights with tribes, um, which is one of the few states that um, that is doing so. Um, so you know, once you once the tribes finally have their water rights, um, are they are they actually able to use to use them? Um, and that's really dependent upon uh, the federal government um, giving funding for for these projects. So with this particular water settlement, um, there will be a drinking water system and in irrigation system. So this is um, kind of tied to the land use, the land use study that um, I'm completing. And um, what, what I found is that, you know, really, um, really very few tribal members um, would be included, would have um, land in, in, these, um, in these irrigation projects. And, um, as the land tenure stands now, um, the, these are really um, within areas that are owned by, by non-tribal members um, and the tribe itself. So um, that's, that's kind of another, another instance of um, you know, the, the tribal administration really um, deciding upon um, you know, what it, it'll decide um, how, how it will manage its own lands. Um, however, 
the um, the tribal members them, themselves um, are are kind of treated as another as another entity um, and don't have the access to the resources and um, you know to the large large pieces of land that that the tribe does. And I, I worked on um, this project myself when I was in, um, before, I, before I started um, my PhD program, I was an engineer um, working with the tribe and um, I was the only engineer. And you know, these are hundreds of millions of dollar um, projects. And it was, um, it was really, um, you know, evident that the tribe needed needed more technical workforce, um, and I I was really advocating that um, that we try to you know, hire interns, um, try to create some type of pipeline program um, you know, with the, we have a tribal college right there um, to to be able to develop um, more people that could. You know, could work um, interning with um, you know the the engineering companies that we really outsource all of this to um, for myself when I was working there um, and um, you know there there's just really so many barriers um, for for individual people um, individual tribal members to be able to um, to access um, these projects in this this really hasn't been um, hasn't been detailed um, by by um, scholars. There's not too many um, uh, water water managers who are um, publishing articles about this. Um, so this is this is something that um, you know I, since I worked on, I know the the problems intimately. Um, so I. I um, will continue um, trying to to detail this this um, this problem and how it affects tribal communities and and the need for um, building capacity um, also. So um, with the um, with the capacity building um, that I'm really interested in. Um, you know, training the next the next generation of scientists, engineers, um, you know, in indigenous communities that are um, are really invested in in those communities. Um, I I want to also think about the role of um, of women in building capacity and in building equity. Um, so. I, I think that um, in, in the um, in my own experiences being an engineer, um, you know, I I I recognize the need for um, really encouraging women, um, and also just kind of rethinking um, how how um, how land use. If if we were to to rethink our um, our relationship to land use and to our resources, um, you know, traditionally women have been um, knowledge holders, uh, they're seed keepers, they're um, cultivators of traditional foods, um, you know, and and this is really something that. That I want to continue um, to look at um, in the next in the next phase of my research, um, which will be moving away from um, ener energy development. So moving away from the energy and water relationship to more of the land use um, land use and water relationship, which includes um, traditional traditional foods and um, really. Um, Really thinking about that in terms of capacity building and um, also promoting equity. So, I I want to um, also talk about equity in higher education. Um, you know, since I've talked about the need for 
the need for um, increasing increasing the STEM workforce um, in tribal communities. So um, again, I, I had mentioned that um, I attended Cornell and I also did um, my postdoc at Stanford. And um, when, when um, I, was, I was in my, my um, graduate and postgraduate edu um, education um, portions, I, I was really <laughs> one of the only indigenous students um, that, um, that was in the school. Um, and um, now that I'm faculty, um, I, I really see this, this um, issue with very few indigenous scholars um, at the faculty level and also, um, also enrolled in, in the um, school itself. So I, I have been including this, um, this uh, article. Um, there's some familiar faces here. Um, and mainly it's because it, it's one of, the, um, one of the few articles that I found that actually um, lists the numbers of indigenous students or American Indian students um, in, you know, in these schools. And I usually use it um, I use it when I'm giving a job talk. Um, so I think here it's probably for my job talk at Davis, um, highlighting the <laughs> the number of students. Um, but I mean, again, just so so few um, of us that are actually um, completing that are actually supported enough to be completing our degrees. Um, you know, the the college I graduated from at Cornell. Um, you know, it's not on this list. It's, you know, we were probably um, had one student a year. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some, some schools on here, um, Purdue, um, you know, University of Arizona, um, schools that do have the um, SIGP program. And um, I have I looked at this again recently and University of Wisconsin is on here and um, it's, it's a large school, um, you know, 45,000. Um, so that's um, a really dull number of 12 students every um, four to five years. Um, but you know, now, that, now that I'm faculty, um, I, I see um, these graduate students and I'm, I'm really, um, you know, rooting for them, and um, I'm working with a, a few students um, myself that identify as Indigenous, and um, you know, I, I think that that there's just so much more, so much more that universities can do themselves. Um, I, I think as faculty feel compelled to um, to step in at some level. Um, but I mean, there's there's just so much, so much that needs to be done, um, as evidenced here. So, um, yeah, I I um, really started um, thinking about my my journey um, as an educator when I went to work um, at a tribal college. So. I was an instructor at the University, um, sorry, United Tribes Technical College, um, which is in Bismarck, North Dakota. And um, I um, just, I just have such um, respect for um, the, the work that tribal colleges do and um, you know, the support that they, they give their students. Um, I really enjoy attending the AHEC uh, conference whenever I have an opportunity to. And um, I really, really want to continue supporting um, tribal college students um, that if they come, if they uh, eventually apply to, to um, complete their four-year degree um, at places like the University of Wisconsin or any of the other places I've I've worked. Um, it's it, that's a really difficult transition. 
Um, but you know, again, I think that's that's um, really an opportunity for um, for a lot of our tribal students to to start their education. So um, um, just uh, just always want to plug tribal colleges and supporting them and supporting research and the students. Um, and I also have to mention the uh, the ACES program. Um, I've been on the board of directors uh, for three years now, and I was reelected to another term. Um, ACES has just been really helpful for me um, ever since I was a high school high school student attending my first conference, and um, I just always enjoyed the um, the community that um, that I would find at conferences and um, yeah just always always a great way to to support the the next generation of up and coming engineers and scientists um, okay I am running a little short on time here um, but I just wanted to also um, point out the the amount of Native American faculty um, that um, are are joining the ranks. Um, so one of my colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, and um, also just the um, the Native American role models. Um, two of our Congresswomen have been recently elected. Um, this is my good friend, um, Candy Mossett, with the IEN Indigenous Environmental Network, um, and, and also other role models. Um, so, sorry, are you, did you lose my screen? Um, okay, I will try to start Sorry, not sure what's happening here I think you I'm not sure if you can you still share your screen again or um, Oh, there we go. Okay, good Are you able to see my screen? Um, so, uh, okay. hold on, Grace. I, we can't see it now, so I think we saw it before. I'm not sure what happened again. Yeah, um, it, it's just been advancing really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I will um, try again. I, w I was nearly finished, um, but I really just wanted to um, to end with kind of tying tying everything together um, just really quickly. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about the um, about the about the impact of, um, you know, of, of the control of our resources and why this is important. Um, so um, the, the work that my, my good friend, um, Candy Mossett does with Indigenous and Environmental Network um, really, uh, really speaks to the, um, the role of environment um, resource extraction and um, you know violence against women, and this has been an issue that's um, really been really been um, important to me um, definitely in my in my work on um, resource control. Um, 
So I'm just including um, some of the some of the activists that are really involved um, with this athletes. Um, Connie Walker is a she's a, a podcast host. Um, she uh, hosts the show Missing and Murdered, which is really excellent. I would I would encourage um, everyone to listen to that. Uh, Mary Catherine Nagel, playwright, um, and also the Sovereign Bodies Institute. Um, and I, I'm really grateful um, to these to these women. Um, they've helped me personally. Um, I um, I've been I've been very affected by this. Um, my my niece, my sister's daughter, um, she went missing last year, and. Um, Eventually, she was identified um, two weeks after after her body was found in Montana, in Bighorn County, and um, I I've really been um, advocating for for answers and for an adequate investigation um, into into her disappearance, into her murder, and. Um, I, I held a series of events um, on the anniversary of when she went missing um, for those, those five days um, until she was discovered. And um, I, I had Connie Walker um, talk about MMIW and the media. Um, also Candy talk about um, extractive industries and violence against women and um, the Sovereign Bodies Institute, as well as the um, National Indian Women's Resource um, Center um, were really helpful with that. Um, and it, it's really just um, opened my eyes to, um, to tell how hard it is for, for families to um, have to navigate the system um, themselves, um, you know, in states like Montana, where um, where things are really dictated by the um, county law enforcement, by the attorney general, um, who are who are often um, you know, really um, really um, political. Um, it's a really red state. Um, Native Americans are the are the largest minority. Um, so these are. <laughs> These are some of the things that, um, that we made for this campaign, um, and this is this is my own my own lab group. Um, this is the the window um, outside of my lab space, um, which I haven't been able to to visit very much. Um, so I I will just um, close with um, some images that. Um, I, I think are, are really telling um, about the um, about the the politis politicization of our of our resources. Um, the current president um, invited um, several tribal chairpersons um, to an energy roundtable, and um, my own tribal chairman was there as well as um, uh, the chairman of my mother's tribe. Um, and um, you know the the narrative is is that tribes um, should have the authority to develop their resources. Um, so you know you can see who's who's at the table. Um, and um, another ongoing issue is the um, the um, pipelines that will be built um, through through the plains. Um, there's already the Keystone XL is being completed. Um, as well, well as the Dakota Access Pipeline, and um, you know it's it's affecting so many um, tribal communities that already have um, high numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, um, and Indigenous people. And um, I <laughs> I include these um, these pictures. Um, so this was when. Um, Vice President Pence uh, visited the tribal, my tribal community, uh, went riding horseback. Um, Excuse me, Grace, 
we, we can't yeah. see the pictures. Just want to let you know we can't see the pictures, so I'm not sure if you're if in pictures you want to share with us. Oh, you can't see? No, we can't see the pictures. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you see this one? All we all we see is you talking. Your 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 face is right in front of us. Okay. Um, wow. Sorry. That's okay. Just wanted to get, let you know as you're talking, you're describing the pictures. Just um, uh, I'm not sure if you want to re start sharing again. Okay. There it says Grace has started sharing screen. It's all we see right now. Is that showing now? Nope, sorry, nothing. Um, okay, I'm, I'm pretty Oh, there much, we go. Um, we got it. We got it. Of, <laughs> at the end of the presentation. Okay, no, um, we, we got it now. We can see it. So, um, yeah, so the, um, all, of, all of the political leaders um, are really eager to, to show up um, when, they, when they want to talk about our resources. Um, and also, also ask the the tribe for um, their political. So, I <laughs> just close with with all of the politicians, a lot of them who have been reelected um, yesterday, um, including the um, the attorney general who um, is charged with investigating. Okay, I don't know what happened there. I, all of a sudden, I just see um, the screen went went completely out. So I think we may have lost Grace in uh, as she was getting ready to close her presentation. And um, I don't know if we want to wait around just for her to come back, or see if there's any specific questions that we can answer. Um, So, well, just in closing, I think I, we'll, I'll just kind of um, offer some comments now, just be, as we as we see if we can get reconnected with Grace here. She, uh, yeah, she brought up some a, a lot of relevant topics that were that are uh, um, you see these same type of stories and same type of situations echoed throughout Indian country. And um, as she was showing pictures of having to transport water in bottles and that's something that is still happening on many tribal nations across the country. Uh, I'm coming from Navajo Nation and we still have uh, areas on our tribal nation that have no electricity or no running water and we see that all that same story repeated uh, throughout many tribal nations and it's interesting as we're talking about uh, providing resources and how that's one of the here in the United States the year 2020 we still have communities that that are battling those type of um, challenges and, and developing those type of in infrastructure um, and then also she did raise a very important point about missing and murdered indigenous women so I think that is uh, I'm, I'm really um, I was really moved that she was willing to share her story about her how this impacted her own family because this is this is a very important and serious matter that's taking place throughout Indian country and there's really not much awareness that is raised to it except when we have presentations or when we're bringing about um, we share stories as, as she was able to do so. So on, on that note, you know, I, I would just welcome if anybody wants to offer some comments and and in that in that uh, as we're doing that we'll see if we can try to get Grace back on the line. Um, so um, oh there you are. Hi Grace, how are you doing? Hi, sorry. Um... I, I signed on with another another device. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Yeah, that that's fine. I, I was just commenting and and just kind of um just sharing some information. 
I, I just talked about re really briefly about the, the images that you showed when you shared your pictures of, you know, having to transport your own water. And I was just kind of detailing how this also is important. It's still very relevant within Indian country. Oh. You know, how that's happening within my own reservation on the Navajo reservation. And then also, I really do commend you for sharing your story about your, your family members and uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, just because it's such an important issue that is often going unheard throughout the country. So thank you for sharing that story with us. Uh, so I see Daryl is unmuted. I'm not sure if Daryl has a question for you. I'll go ahead and have Daryl ask your question. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Voltaire. As you probably know, I definitely consider you a mentor, a friend, and also a role model for the type of indigenous scholar that I'm striving to be. Um, and I appreciate you sharing you. your personal stories and also keeping all of these topics that you talked about today at the forefront of the you know, broader academic community's discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially for indigenous people, you know, like a lot of times, um, we're just erased from that narrative whole, I don't, you know, just completely. <laughs> um, I had a couple of different questions, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just ask one for now is, what indicators, like specific indicators or criteria do you think we should be looking for at, you know, the federal, state and local levels that would represent more equitable relationships between tribal and non-tribal governmental agencies? Like, are there policy changes that you think would really represent like greater equity? Um, or if there's different types of frameworks you use to kind of like help you analyze that, I would be really interested. Yeah, um, I had a little bit of a problem hearing you, um, but, um, what policies would yeah, be more yeah. beneficial? Yeah, how do we recognize equity? You know, you talked a little bit about equity, but what can um, policymakers or educators or even just community members, like what can we look to and point to and say like, look, this, is, this represents greater equity? Oh, indicators. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of, um, a lot of institutions, a lot of, um, programs, they, um, they want to recruit, <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. They, they want to, um, you know, um, increase equity by, um, diversity. Um, but it really, they, they need to have something to offer, um, to offer these students, um, to offer graduate students, um, and and really, um, you know, I, I hear from so many students, and I see I see it um, that the burden for um, for creating um, a diverse community is really put on the students themselves. Um, you know, definitely um, the undergraduate students. Um, I. I stepped away um, as a graduate student, um, but you know, really, um, it's it's put on put on um, the undergrads themselves. Um, they're you know, just really torn in so many different directions. Um, you know, an indicator. Um, how about you know how much <laughs> how much um, funding is there for? Um, for your for your students um you know how how many students have been supported um and you know really that's that's what's going to make um to to make the students want to come to the university um stay there um uh, be supported um also faculty um you know I, I mentioned that um, now that I'm faculty, um, I of course want to support um, all the students that that come to me, um, and particularly um, the indigenous students. And um, you know, I, I think that a lot of a lot of my peers, um, a lot of my indigenous peers, have 
have um, that same experience. Um, and, um, you know, we, we hear um, from them, you know, the problems they're having at the university. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that if there were more of us <laughs> faculty members, um, you know, that, that we could um, more effectively um, reach out to, you know, reach out and assist the students, have some, have some type of, um, community ourselves um, you know right now um, there there are a few stem faculty um, at least in the university I work in so so that's been um, that's been really great to, to have other people to mentor me um, you know but really like what what are the resources what, what what's the funding um, uh, how, how many faculty do you have how many how many scholars do you support Thank you. you. I think you raised a really important issue that, that uh, I hear from a lot of junior faculty members, especially indigenous uh, faculty who are working hard to, um, you know, work towards tenure and everything. But the fact that you serve as a mentor for students, even though it may not even be in your portfolio, or are you, you know, how can you account for that? Or how can you get credit for that as part of your tenure process? And I th that's one thing I hear from a lot of our uh, uh, faculty and, and, um, and it's, it's not something that you step into. It's, it's something you're passionate about because you, as well as other Indigenous faculty, really want to see Indigenous students succeed. And so in that respect, you, know, you take it upon yourself to seek out the students and provide that, that guidance and mentorship that they're often seeking. And, and many times they'll come and they'll seek you out. If there's, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's Indigenous faculty on the campus, you see how that's, that's where they reach out. And, and we do have uh, for instance, Ken, I know Ken's on, our, on, on here, but he, uh, he's been very good about reaching across the aisle and connecting with students, even though they may not be in his field of study, but he does serve as a mentor for many, many, facul many uh, Native students across campus. So that's, that's the issue when you only have, you know, what, uh, just a, a, a handful of Native faculty on campus because you end up becoming uh, an advocate and you help mentoring them. So I'm sure when you're, when you're in that, um, when you're in that role, you know, you, you want to make sure you see students succeed. So maybe if you want to talk a little bit about how, you know, you're, you've been able to use some of your mentorship skills and how you were mentored and how you're able to turn around because now you yourself are serving in that mentorship role. Yeah, um, I, I think that um, seeing, seeing all the challenges that um, that faculty face um, has been has been eye opening, um, but as as far as mentoring, um, you know, I I think it's really about it's really about um, thinking about the pipeline. Um, you know, as as I had mentioned, um, you know, I I was one of um, the few Indigenous students, um, definitely at, at Cornell, Columbia. Um, my Stanford for my my postdoc, um, and um, thinking about the resources that that supported me. Um, so when when I was at Cornell, I had a really great um, funding from the school funding sources from the school itself, um, also from several several of the other. Um, the other organizations that support uh, Native students, um, such as the American Indian Graduate um, Graduate Center and um, you know, the Cobell. I actually didn't get the Cobell because um, I wasn't eligible. But um, you know, all of these all of these sources. Um, but when I I found when um, when I became a postdoc, um, those those sources weren't available to me. Um, because I was no longer a graduate student, um, but I was you know, very much doing the same the same research, um, and uh, in a very expensive expensive place, um, and I really didn't have um, much research funding. You know, so when I really could have used, you know, all of all of these resources, 
And um, you know, I, I I looked at these these um, organizations and I said, you know, can you do something to support postdocs? Um, you know, I, I'm on the board at ACES and I am always saying like, can we do something to support postdocs? Um, you know, can we include them in this? You know, in our emergency funding? Um, can we include them in our our research? And um, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's it's a lonely a lonely battle. Um, but I'm I'm hoping <laughs> I, I'm hoping that I'm making some progress. Um, I, I know it's it's a lot to do with um, you know the funding and um, how how those are allocated um, because they're only for graduate students. Um, but you know in in STEM we um, we have to do that postdoc. Um, and postdoc means different things. I found out um, it it can mean um, you're you're on a a break from your um, faculty position um, in a non STEM field. Um, so you know you have to be really really careful about how you describe a postdoc. Um, but you know it, it's just things like that. And you know Daryl's one of the few STEM postdocs I know, and um, you know. I think that it, it's not until we, we get there ourselves that we're like, hey, um, this is a huge problem. And, um, you know, since I've been there, um, that's, that's something that I'm very much paying attention to. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that, um, I don't know, maybe there's probably other things I'm going to find as, as, a, as a faculty member. Um, but luckily, um, you know, there there have been um, so many of my peers, so many of my my indigenous peers that have been so willing to um, to help out, to you know, to include new faculty and to reach out to them, and um, you know, to offer support. Um, but there is there is hope for <laughs> for those postdocs out there. Um, you know, I I found becoming you know becoming faculty, um, although I have ton more responsibilities and pulled in different directions. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, there, there um, are so many, so many resources once, once you get to the other side. Um, so, so that's the, the next phase that, that I'm going to be dealing with. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really really trying to to reach out to indigenous students and um to bring them into my lab and to mentor them and um now i'm, I'm finding it's really hard to recruit graduate students so so that's my that's my next um challenge i'll have to face okay great excellent well we are past the time and we are, uh, but if we have another question, we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna go ahead and officially end our presentation for recording purposes, and but we can stay a little bit around a little bit longer. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I know there was a question that came up. We do have a YouTube page, um, just search Purdue in AECC. This interview will probably be posted uh, maybe tomorrow once we get it, um, we gotta download it and clean it up and everything. Uh, so it'll be posted up on our, on our NACC page. But if you're interested in joining us, we do have, uh, like, I said a number of events that are taking place for the for the month. Tomorrow is our next presentation. We're focusing on our Sloan, uh, highlighting our Sloan, highlighting indigenous research researchers with the indigenous uh, with the SIGP program. And we have two students that will be joining us. So um, we will. I, I encourage you to check out our website. We have our up events that are uploaded to our website, as well as uh, uh, you can follow us on social media. We are on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can. Just search Purdue in AECC and you'll be able to find our upcoming programs. But with that, again, thank you so much, Dr. Bulltail, for joining us and spending the evening with us and sharing your knowledge. It was a wonderful presentation. And um, I would, um, we, at this point, we will go ahead and officially end the recording. So I'll ask Deb to go ahead and end it.